So the, the last speaker of the morning session will be Peter Shore, who will talk about a power law violation of the area law uh, in quantum spin, 1D quantum spin chains. Okay. So I'll be talking about power law. I mean, we've heard a lot about area laws here so before, so maybe I should go through the background slides quickly. So there are two ways of quantifying entanglement I'll be talking about in this talk. One of them is the Schmidt decomposition, which are the Schmidt rank, which is just the number of, let's see, first, okay, I want, so this is the thing, yeah. So it's the number of non-zero coefficients in the Schmidt decomposition. The other one is the standard measure of entanglement entropy. And this um, work was started, you know, this work was um, about area laws. The area law, at least one formulation is an area law. Suppose you have a Hamiltonian which only has local interactions and the quantum system is in the ground state of the Hamiltonian. What the area law says is that the entropy of entanglement between two subsystems is proportional not to the volume of the subsystem, as you might think at first, but to the area of the boundary between them. So there hasn't been, area, I mean, area laws have only been proved in one case, which is Hastings has proved that one-dimensional gapped local systems obey an area law. And here gapped means there's a constant size gap between the ground state and the excited state. And this makes them easy to simulate on a classical computer because all of these um, things, matrix product states, DMRG, um, work very well for one-dimensional systems with area laws. Now it's believed that higher dimensional gap systems satisfy area laws. So this is still a very important open question. And for critical systems where there's a phase transition, you believe, oh wait, okay, where, where are we? <coughs> Pushed the wrong button there. For critical systems, it's believed that the area law contains an extra log factor. So in D dimens spatial dimensions, one would expect that the entropy is order d to the minus one for gap systems and extra log l for critical systems. Okay. So for one dimensional spin chains like critical points, the continuous limit generally belongs to a conformal field theory. And what we know about conformal field theories is that the spectral gap is one over n and the entropy of entanglement is O of log n, and here is the n is the number of spins in the chain. So now what we can do is worry about the um, idea that started our research. So while we knew that simulating spin 1D spin dimensional spin chains with local Hamiltonians was beekeeping complete, which means we think it can't be done classically, and we know that one-dimensional spin chains with low entanglement are classically simulable. And therefore, we know that there must be one-dimensional spin, spin chains that have high entanglement and therefore violate the area law. So we started worrying about how can we find some of these explicitly. So our first idea, which we wrote up in um, 2010, was take a spin chain with Q of dimension D and have the interactions be of them be a random projection of dimension i. So what we could prove is that the ground straight is frustration free when d is related to r according to this equation. And we can compute the Schmidt ranks and the um, dimension of the ground state and all these dimensions, but you know, so Schmidt rank is only a very poor indicator of entanglement. What we'd really like to do is show that there are no, or rather every state in the ground state space space and the 
the subspace corresponding to the ground state as high entanglement. And we couldn't obtain any definitive results on the spectral gap and the entanglement entropy. We could look at the results of numerical computations, which made it look like there's large entanglement and uh, polynomial spectral gap, but these, you know, these are very difficult computations to do, and you can only do it on s small length chains, so we didn't have any real results on spectral gap or entanglement entropy. Now, Sandy Arani in 2010, you know, took her BQP complete um, spin chain and showed that you can use it to find Hamiltonians with spectral gap one over n to the c and entanglement entropy O of n, which is as large as it can be. It's proportional to the volume and not the boundary. But the disadvantage of these and the reason they're dismissed by, say, um, condensed matter physicists as fine-tuned is that they're very complicated Hamiltonians with rather high-dimensional spins. Now, in 2012, which is really the um, precursor to this work, we found that there are Hamiltonians whose gown states have spectral gap polynomial, have entanglement entropy order of log n, are frustration free, and have, these are spin chains where the spins have dimension three. And I'll explain how this result works in a little while, but let me finish describing my results first. So our results say now, there are Hamiltonians whose ground states have spectral gap O of one over n to the c, have entanglement entropy O of root n, have spins of dimension, odd dimension, that's, so instead of three, we have to go up to five for this to happen, and are frustration free. So you can see that this breaks the area law by a square root of n factor rather than a log n factor. The log n factor could be explained by saying that the system was critical. The square root of n factor doesn't match any of the condensed matter theorists' um, ideas about how spin chains should behave. So, and there's another result which we haven't proved rigorously and, well, parts of it may be very difficult to prove rigorously, we're still thinking about it, but there are um, Hamiltonians whose ground states probably have spectral gap, one over n to the c, have entanglement entropy, O of root n. The ground state is unique, so they're not, um, you know, it's not a degenerate ground state space. They're not frustration free. That's what you have to give up to get a unique ground state and have spins of 2s plus 1. And for all the previous things, we need to specify boundary conditions on the spin chains to have everything work. For these, you can just use free boundary conditions. Okay, so how do these things work? Okay, so the way I'm going to explain this is first I'll explain what the state, the unique ground state of the local Hamiltonian is and then I will explain why the Hamiltonian gives that as a unique ground state. And here we can compute lower order terms of the entanglement entropy and here's the Schmidt rank, it's just the geometric series. The gap upper bound is O of n to the minus two and this corresponds to our previous result. So remember conformal field theories had a one over n gap. So this shows that the continuous limit is not a conformal field theory, probably, which brings up the question, what is the continuous limit of this spin chain if it exists? And well, we don't really know. And the lower bound is omega of n to the minus c. And um, oh, these are the techniques used to prove them. Okay. So what do these spins 
look like? Well, I told you they are 2s minus pl plus 1 states. We'll call these L sub L sub i, i going from 1 to s, r sub i, i going from 1 to s, and 0 are the names of the states. And you can think of L sub i as being a left parenthesis, r sub i as being a right parenthesis, and 0 being a 0. And you can also think of this as being a step up, a step down, and a step across. So those are the names of our states. And for s equals 2, we have two different types of parentheses, two different colors of steps up and steps down, and we'll say L1 and L2. So what do the ground states look like? So what the ground state will be is the superposition of all Motzkin walks. So what is a Motzkin walk? A Motzkin walk is a you know, walk on a length, oops, no wait, a length 2n chain, which starts at 0, ends at 0, always stays above the x-axis, and the steps are either up, down, or horizontal. And you can turn these into map sets of parentheses, left, right, left, zero, left. Yeah, so up is left, down is right, and horizontal is zero. So why is there entanglement in this state? Well, what we know is that the amount that it goes up in the left half is equal to the amount it goes down in the right half. So there's a number here we can compute from looking at the left half between 1 and n. And the number over here, where it goes down in the right half, again, between 1 over n. So we know that these numbers are the same. So the entanglement is, a fact is due to the fact that the number of steps up here is the number of steps down here. There are log n bits of information in the number of steps up which means the entanglement is log n. Now, suppose we have two types of parentheses to match. Well, it's exactly the same. It's a colored Motzkin walk, which means the steps up are either blue or red. And a red step here, a red step up is matched by a red step down. So now, instead of just the number of steps, you get the sequence of steps. So you can look over here. Here is the middle. You can look to the left. You can see a red step and then a blue step. So this sequence is matched by the sequence blue, red on the right. So now the number of bits that are communicated across is just the length, the height of this walk. And you know that random walks behave like Brownian motion. So the height of this is square root of n, which says that there's square root of n entanglement between the left half and the right half. OK. What happened? Yeah, so this is the same thing. The, the brackets have to match. So if they don't match, um, it's not a valid state, and we will, Hamiltonian will have an energy penalty for that. Okay, so here's an example of the ground state for s equals 1. So for Motzkin walk of length 2, it's 1 half 0, 0 plus left, right. And for a Motzkin state of length 4, it's all sequences of lefts and rights with an even number of lefts and rights where they parentheses match. And you can also, for um, colored Motzkin walks, you get, in a set for every left, right, there are k possibilities for the colors. OK. So now, one nice thing about combinatorics is that we know exactly the number of Motzkin walks 
this dark is zero, and at height m, I have s total colors because this is a combinatorial quantity which has been calculated, and this is the formula for it. It's actually not that hard to show. And so what we need to do is we need to find what this looks like. Now, of course, you will know with these combinatorial quantities, they're very, very highly concentrated here. So for the Moskin wealth of length n equals 90 and um, one type of parenthesis, it's, um, you know, almost certainly um, I is, oh, I don't know, 30 and M is fairly small. Okay, so M was square root of N. Okay, so you can turn this sum into an integral, do saddle point integration, and you get these properties. So, um, and that gives a value for the entangled Okay, so how did we get these with a Hamiltonian? Well, a Hamiltonian, here's a Hamiltonian, and we have, I'll, well, I'll just go through and tell you what all the terms do in the next slides. These terms say that the grounds, the any state that is frustration free is an equal superposition of all Moskin walks that can be reached by switching LK and zero, switching RK and zero, and replacing LK, RK by zero, zero. So these are just like hopping terms. And um, so this says it's an equal superposition of Moskin walks. The cross terms say that the left parenthesis and the has to match the equal, the sign of the right parenthesis because what happens is if they didn't, you'd get a term where you have a left parenthesis of red and a right parenthesis of blue, and this gives you an energy penalty when they're next to each other, which, because of this random walk, they will be. And this boundary term says that the walk is balanced. Okay, so now how do we show that the gap is order of n to the minus 2 for an upper bound? <coughs> Well, to do that, all we need to do is find some state of the chain such that um, its energy is order of n to the minus 2, and it has a small overlap with the ground state. And then you can break this down into energy eigenstates and compute the energy. If you compute the energy of this, well, the frustration free, so the ground state gives you zero energy, so you get alpha 1 squared times the energy of the first excited state plus alpha 2 squared times the energy of the second excited state, etc., which is just 1 minus alpha g squared, the um, amplitude of the ground state, times the energy, well, it, all of these are bigger than the energy of the first excited state, so it's bigger than 1 minus alpha g squared times the energy of the um, ground state. So that is the proof that it's n to the minus 2, except we need to find, figure out what this walk is. Well, what it is, is you just take, oh gosh, <laughs> you just take e to the 2 pi i times the area of the peep Moskin walk. You just put this coefficient in front of the peep Moskin walk. And we know the exact distribution of areas of Brownian motion. That's this formula. So we can compute that exactly and asymptotically when Moskin walks go to Brownian motion as n goes to infinity. And we get O of minus of O of n to the minus two. And how do we do the lower bound? Well, it's the same techniques as Bravu as our previous paper, and I'm not going to go into them because there's no time. So now I want to talk about our frustration. No, so 
instead of the frustration-free Hamiltonian, a frustrated Hamiltonian, which has nicer properties in some senses. Well, so I don't, this Hamiltonian isn't completely satisfactory because it really requires the boundary conditions to get a unique ground state. So without the boundary conditions, well, each of these um, imbalanced walks, where the walk starts at zero, say, and ends at three, will give you uh, another ground state. And you can see that show that there are n plus two choose two different ground states. So we'd like to get rid of these ground states without using boundary conditions. So what we can do is we can add an energy penalty for a left parenthesis and a right parenthesis, which says we really would like more zeros than anything else. And what that does is it makes the balanced walk the ground, unique ground state. So how do we prove that this still has a spectral gap? So it's not too hard to prove that this is still going to have order of Rudan entanglement because it still looks like Brownian motion. So we need to prove that it has a small spectral gap. Well, the argument that the gap is at most order of n to the minus 2 still holds because it still looks like Brownian motion. And you can still add e to the um, area under the walk and get or e to the i times the area under the walk times theta. And the argument still goes through. <coughs> so what we have to do is lower boundary gap in two cases, unbalanced walks where the superposition of all unbalanced walks with whatever um, amplitude gives you the ground st the lowest energy of that, and the superposition of balanced walks with, this is supposed to be complex and not positive. So superposition of balanced walks with complex coefficients, <laughs> and unbalanced walks with positive coefficients. <laughs> OK, so the gap for unbalanced walks. Well, if you let epsilon be the energy penalty for uh, parenthesis over zero, you can use um, perturbation theory to show that these ground states have an energy of <coughs> order um, epsilon squared. Uh, there shouldn't be a theta in there. C times epsilon squared over n. So this is a 1 over n gap, a spectral gap. Now the gap for the states in the balanced subspace, well, so our only proof that these have a small gap is the idea that they're going to behave the same as in the case where there's no energy penalty and it's frustration free. And we can see from numerics that the gap seems to be the same, or no, have the same rate of growth with an energy penalty with and without, or with and without an energy penalty for this Hamiltonian. And that the gap in the balanced subspace with an energy penalty is also order of n to the minus 2. So we think this Hamiltonian has a gap of order n to the minus 2. OK, so that's all the results I have. So here are some interesting open questions. First is, is there some kind of continuum limit for these Hamiltonians? We know it's probably not a conformal field theory unless it behaves, unless it's a weird kind of conformal field theory or a weird kind of limit. Um, second question is, can we rigorously prove the results when you have an external magnetic field? And the third question is, are there frustration-free Hamiltonians with unique ground states which violate the area law by large factors? So we got rid of, you know, I should say unique ground states and no boundary conditions. We have one with unique ground states and boundary conditions. So can we, is there a different way of getting rid of the boundary conditions and keeping the, keeping the Hamiltonian frustration-free? OK, thank you.
Any questions? Uh, Daniel? And then Toby after that. So this uh, second question, I guess, is basically a question about whether the results are stable under perturbation. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, the, that's essentially the question. And have you done like numerical studies or something? Um, we've done some numerical studies, and it looks like they are stable under perturbation. But um, right. yeah, I mean, there's a limit to how large, how long change you can do without doing some, you know, without, with, you know, without being clever. <laughs> Yeah, so I was worried Dan was going to say ask the same question as me, but he didn't. Um, so I was wondering why you can't use the result or the trick in Dan and Sandy's paper of putting increase the Hilbert space that I mentioned by two, and just rescale the Hamiltonian and put penalties that force those two new special states to be at the end of the chains, and then they can play the role of your boundary terms. Um, Um, we haven't thought about it, okay. so. I mean, it doesn't give you fi dimension five. It would give dimension seven. Maybe you can get it maybe six, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, if you actually want an uh, infinite chain having, yeah, having these boundary terms, uh, having these things at the end is not going to work. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We should um, look into it. I have a question also. Is there, when you say you don't think there, these are conformal field theories, what is a rigorous statement that you could prove that would imply that it's not equivalent in some way to a conformal theory? Um, well, I mean, so the stat, I mean, that's a good question. Because it's not gaps, you can't do it. You know, well, I mean, so if. The standard way of turning a uh, one-dimensional spin chain into a conformal field theory gives you a gap of one over n in the conformal <laughs> field theory, yeah. or rather, I, I mean, the gap ends up being one over n. So if you do this during the standard way, we know the gap is one over n squared, so the standard way is not going to work. Okay. But as I said, there might be a different way, in which case they really are equivalent to conformal field theories. Okay. Uh, Charlie? This is a probably a pretty dumb question, but uh, can't you get rid of the boundary condition just by using a periodic boundary condition? Um, no, because with a periodic boundary condition, well, the periodic boundary condition decreases the um, degeneracy of the ground state, but you have a wall which, when you go around, you can come out one about one you know, you can come out one um, step up or two steps up or three steps up. And so you still get a degeneracy of order n with a periodic boundary condition with the original um, Hamiltonian. Now, if you take a periodic boundary condition and you make it, um, you, you know, you add an energy penalty for steps up and down, then you get exactly the same question as um, with the um, free boundary condition. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Peter again for his talk. Oh, Rania with an announcement.